Hello, evening everyone. Welcome back to part two and the remaining chapters of The Lessons of History by Will and Ariel Durant. It uh, was a very interesting first part. If you haven't seen it, I recommend you go back and check out part one where we dealt with history and the earth, biology and history, race and history and character and history. And we will begin this evening with morals and history, then move on to religion and history, economics and history, socialism and history, government and history, history and war, growth and decay, and is progress real? And the book is sort of a chronological um, view of history, starting with the biology and then progressing on to these more and more complex ideas. I found it very interesting, the first um, five chapters. And so I hope that the remaining chapters will be as interesting, which I'm sure they will. So let's get right into it. My microphone wants to fall off. <clears throat> Chapter six, morals and history. Morals are the rules by which a society exhorts, as laws are the rules by which it keeps, seeks to compel its members and associations to behaviour consistent with its order, security and growth. So, for sixteen centuries, the Jewish enclaves in Christendom maintained their continuity and internal peace by a strict and detailed moral code, almost without help from the state and its laws. A little knowledge of history stresses the variability of moral codes and concludes that they are negligible because they differ in time and place and sometimes contradict each other. A larger knowledge stresses the universality of moral codes and concludes to their necessity. Oh, hi there, KVNJ. Good afternoon to you. Welcome. Moral codes differ because they adjust themselves to historical and environmental conditions. If we divide economic history into three stages, hunting, agriculture and industry, we may expect that the moral code of one stage will be changed in the next. In the hunting stage, a man had to be ready to chase and fight and kill. When he had caught his prey, he ate to the cubic capacity of his stomach, being uncertain when he might eat again. Insecurity is the mother of greed, as cruelty is the memory, if only in blood, of a time when the test of survival, as now between states, was the ability to kill. Presumably the death rate in men, so often risking their lives in the hunt, was higher than in women. Some men had to take several women, and every man was expected to help women to frequent pregnancy. Pugnacity, brutality, greed and sexual readiness were advantages in the struggle for existence. Probably every vice was once a virtue i.e. a quality making for the survival of the individual, the family or the group. Man's sins may be the relics of his rise rather than the stigma of his fall. History does not tell us just when history does not tell us just when men passed from hunting to agriculture, perhaps in the Neolithic age and through the discovery that grain could be sown to add to the spontaneous growth of wild wheat. We may reasonably assume that the new regime demanded new virtues and changed some old virtues into vices. Industriousness became more vital than bravery, regularity and thrift more profitable than violence, peace more victorious than war. Children were economic assets, birth control was made immoral. On the farm, the family was the unit of production under the discipline of the father and the seasons, and paternal authority had a firm economic base. Each normal son matured soon in mind and self-support. At fifteen, he understood the physical tasks of life as well as he would understand them at forty. All that he needed was land, a plough, and a willing arm. So he married early, almost as soon as nature wished. He did not fret long under the restraints placed upon premarital relations by the order of permanent settlements and homes. As for young women, chastity was indispensable, for its loss might bring unprotected motherhood. Monogamy was demanded by the approximate numerical quality, equality of the sexes, 
For 1,500 years, this agricultural moral code of continence, early marriage, divorceless monogamy and multiple maternity maintained itself in Christian Europe and its white colonies. It was a stern code which produced some of the strongest characters in history. Gradually, then rapidly and ever more widely, the Industrial Revolution changed the economic form and moral superstructure of European and American life. Men, women and children left home and family, authority and unity to work as individuals, individually paid in factories built to house not men, but machines. Every decade the machines multiplied and became more complex. Economic maturity, the capacity to support a family, came later. Children no longer were economic assets. Marriage was delayed. Premarital continence became more difficult to maintain. The city offered every discouragement to marriage, but it provided every stimulus and facility for sex. Women were emancipated, i.e. industrialized, and contraceptives enabled them to separate intercourse from pregnancy. The authority of father and mother lost its economic base through the growing individualism of industry. The rebellious youth was no longer constrained by the surveillance of the village. He could hide his sins in the protective anonymity of the city crowd. The progress of science raised the authority of the, of the test tube over that of the crossier. The mechanization of economic production suggested mechanistic, materialistic philosophies. Education spread religious doubts. Morality lost more and more of its supernatural supports. The old agricultural moral code began to die. In our time, as in the time of Socrates, 399 BC, and Augustus, AD 14, war has added to the forces making for moral laxity. After the violence and social disruption of the Peloponnesian War, Alcibiades left felt free to flout the moral code of his ancestors, and Thrasymachus could announce that that might was the only right. After the wars of Marius and Sulla, Caesar and Pompey, Antony and Octavius, Rome was full of men who had lost their economic footing and their moral stability. Soldiers who had tasted adventure and had learned to kill, citizens who had seen their savings consumed in the taxes and inflation caused by war, women dizzy with freedom, multiplying divorces, abortions and adultery. A shallow sophistication, a shallow sophistication prided itself upon its pessimism and cynicism. It is almost a picture of European and American cities after two world wars. History offers some consolation by reminding us that sin has flourished in every age. Even our generation has not yet rivaled the popularity of homosexualism in ancient Greece or Rome or Renaissance Italy. The humanists wrote about it with a kind of scholarly affection, and Aris Ariosto judged that they were all addicted to it. Aretino asked the Duke of Mantua to send him an attractive boy. Prostitution has been perennial and universal from the state-regulated brothels of Assyria to the nightclubs of West Europe and American cities today. In the University of Wittenberg in 1544, according to Luther, the race of girls is getting bold and run after the fellows in their, into their rooms and chambers and wherever they can and offer them their free love. Wow, that's uh, 1544. <laughs> Montaigne tells us that in his time, 1533-92, to 92, obscene literature found a ready market. The immorality of our stage differs in kind rather than degree from that of Restoration England and John Cleland's memoirs of a woman of pleasure, a veritable catenar of coitus, was as popular in 1749 as in 1965. We have noted the discovery of dice in the excavations near the site of Nineveh. Men and women have gambled in every age. In every age men have been dishonest and governments have been corrupt, probably less now than generally before. The pamphlet, literature of the 16th century Europe, groaned with denunciations of wholesale adulteration of food and other products. Man has never reconciled himself to the Ten Commandments, Oh, hi there, Mimi. Long time no see. How are you? Welcome. 
We have seen Voltaire's view of history as mainly a collection of the crimes, follies and misfortunes of mankind, and Gibbon's echo of that summary. We must remind ourselves again that history as usually written is quite different from history as usually lived. The historian records the exceptional because it is interesting, because it is exceptional. If all those individuals who had no Boswell had found their numerically proportionate place in the pages of historians, we should have a duller but just a view of the past and of man. Behind the red facade of war and politics, misfortune and poverty, adultery and divorce, murder and suicide, were millions of orderly homes, devoted marriages, men and women, kindly and affectionate, troubled and happy with children. Even in recorded history we find so many instances of goodness, even of nobility, that we can forgive, though not forget, the sins. The gifts of charity have almost equaled the cruelties of battlefields and jails. How many times, even in our sketchy narratives, we have seen men helping one another. Farinelli providing for the children of Domenico Scarlatti, diverse people succoring young Hayden, Conti Lita, paying for Johann Christian Back studies at Bologna, Joseph Black advancing money repeatedly to James Watt, P Puchberg patiently lending, to, lending and lending to Mozart, who will dare to write a history of human goodness. So we cannot be sure that the moral laxity of our times is a herald of decay rather than a painful or delightful transition between a moral code that has lost its agricultural basis and another that our industrial civilization has yet to forge into social order and normality. Meanwhile, history assures us that civilizations decay quite leisurely <laughs> for 250 years after moral weakening began in Greece with the Sophists. Hellenic civilization continued to produce masterpieces of literature and art. Roman morals began to decay soon after the conquered Greeks passed into Italy in 146 BC. But Rome continued to have great statesmen, philosophers, poets and artists until the death of Marcus Aurelius, AD 180. Politically, Rome was at a nadir when Caesar came, 60 BC, yet it did not quite succumb to the barbarians until 465 AD. May we take as long to fall as did imperial Rome. Perhaps discipline will be restored in our civilization through the military training required by the challenges of war. The freedom, the freedom of the part varies with the security of the whole. Individualism will diminish in America and England as geographical protection ceases. Sexual license may cure itself through its own excesses. Our unmoored children may live to see order and modesty become fashionable. Clothing will be more stimulating than nudity. Meanwhile, much of our moral freedom is good. It is pleasant to be relieved of theological terrors, to enjoy without qualm the pleasures that harm neither our others or ourselves, and to feel the tang of the open air upon our liberated flesh. Another interesting chapter. Uh, uh, yeah, no problem, Loki. Thanks for stopping in and um, for saying hello. And like I said in the previous uh, part, I'll say it again, I believe that this is a sort of shorthand, a concise survey of Will and Ariel Durant's longer 10-part uh, series, The Story of Civilization. So if you're enjoying this historical um, survey, which I very much am, I'm, I'm not much of a historian. I've never really been drawn to history, but one thing I do enjoy is sort of these big, um, concise surveys. Uh, I really enjoy Yuval Noah Harari's Sapiens because it's, again, a, a concise survey, a grand narrative of the history of humankind. And I'm very much enjoying this too. I, I don't much like getting into the details for whatever reason, but uh, <laughs> oh. I do enjoy the, uh, the the concise survey or the grand sweep over giant masses of time in a few pages. Chapter 7. Religion and History 
Even the sceptical historian develops a humble respect for religion since he sees it functioning and seemingly indispensable in every land and age. To the unhappy, the suffering, the bereaved, the old, it has brought supernatural comforts valued by millions of souls as more precious than any natural aid. It has helped parents and teachers to discipline the young. It has conferred meaning and dignity upon the lowliest existence, and through its sacraments has made for stability by transforming human covenants into solemn relationships with God. It has kept the poor, said Napoleon, from murdering the rich, for since the natural inequality of men dooms many of us to poverty or defeat, some supernatural hope may be the sole alternative to despair. Destroy that hope and class war is intensified. Heaven and, utopia, heaven and utopia are buckets in a well. When one goes down, the other goes up. When religion declines, communism grows. What an interesting um, thought that is. Uh, hello there, Candy. Uh, very well, thank you. I hope you're doing well. Religion does not seem at first to have had any connection with morals, apparently, for we are merely guessing or echoing Petronius, who echoed Lucretius. It was fear that first made the gods, fear of hidden forces in the earth, rivers, oceans, trees, winds, and sky. Religion proclaimed the proprietary worship of these forces through offerings, sacrifice, incantation, and prayer. Only when priests used these fears and rituals to support morality did and law did religion become a force vital and rival to the state. It told the people that the local code of morals and laws had been dictated by the gods. It pictured the god Thoth giving laws to Menes for Egypt, the god Shamash giving Hammurabi a code for Babylonia, Yahweh giving the Ten Commandments and 613 precepts to Moses for the Jews and the divine nymph Egeria giving Numa Pompilius laws for Rome. Pagan cults and Christian creeds proclaimed that earthly rulers were appointed and protected by the gods. Gratefully, nearly ever every state shared its lands and revenues with the priests. Some Recusants have doubted that religion ever promoted morality, since immorality has flourished even in ages of religious domination. Certainly sensuality, drunkenness, coarseness, greed, dishonesty, robbery and violence existed in Middle Ages, but probably the moral disorder born of half a millennium of barbarian invasion, war, economic devastation and political disorganisation would have been much worse without the moderating effect of the Christian ethic, priestly exhortations, saintly exemplars, and a calming, unifying ritual. The Roman Catholic Church laboured to reduce slavery, family feuds, and national strife, to extend the intervals of truce and peace, and to replace trial by combat or ordeal with the judgments of established courts. It softened the penalties exacted by Roman or barbarian law and vastly expanded the scope and organisation of charity. Though the church served the state, it claimed to stand above all states as morality should stand above power. It taught men that patriotism unchecked by higher loyalty can be a tool of greed and crime. Overall, the competing governments of Christendom, it promulgated one moral law, Claim, claiming divine origin and spiritual hegemony, the Church offered itself as an international court to which all rulers were to be morally responsible. The Emperor, Henry V, recognised this claim by submitting to Pope Gregory VII at Canossa, 1077, and a century later, Innocent III raised the authority and prestige of the papacy to a height where it seemed that Gregory's ideal of a moral superstate had come to fulfilment. The majestic dream broke under the attacks of nationalism, scepticism and human frailty. The church was manned with men who often proved biased, venal or extortionate. France grew in wealth and power and made the papacy her political tool. Kings became strong enough to compel a pope to dissolve that Jesuit order which had so devotedly supported the popes. 
The church stoop to fraud, as with pious legends, bogus relics and dubious miracles, for centuries it profited from a mythical donation of Constantine that had allegedly bequeathed Western Europe to Pope Sylvester I, and from false decretals that forged a series of documents to give a sacred antiquity to papal omnipotence. More and more the hierarchy spent its energies in promoting orthodoxy rather than morality, and the Inquisition almost fatally disgraced the Church. Even while preaching peace, the Church fomented religious wars in 16th century France and the Thirty Years' War in 17th century Germany. It played only a modest part in the outstanding advance of modern morality, the abolition of slavery, it allowed the philosophers to take the lead in the humanitarian movements that have alleviated the evils of our time. <laughs> hey Kimberly, welcome. History has justified the church in the belief that the masses of mankind desire a religion rich in miracle, mystery and myth. Some minor modifications have been allowed in ritual, in ecclesiastical costume, in the epic episcopal authority, but the church dares not alter the doctrines that reason smiles at, for such changes would offend and delusion the millions whose hopes have been tied to inspiring and consolatory imaginations. No reconciliation is possible between religion and philosophy except through the philosopher's recognition that they have found no substitute for the moral function of the church and the ecclesiastical recognition of religious and intellectual freedom. Does history support a belief in God? If by God we mean not the creative vitality of nature but a supreme being, intelligent and benevolent, the answer must be a reluctant negative. Like other departments of biology, history remains at bottom a natural selection of the fittest individuals and groups in a struggle wherein goodness receives no favours, misfortunes abound and the final test is the ability to survive. Add to the crimes, wars and cruelties of man, the earthquakes, storms, tornadoes, pestilence, tidal waves and other acts of God that periodically desolate human and animal life and the total evidence suggests that either a blind or an impartial fatality, with incidental and apparently haphazard scenes to which we subjectively ascribe order, splendour, beauty or sublimity. If history supports any theology, this would be a dualism like the Zoroastrian or Manichaean, a good spirit and an evil spirit battling for control of the universe and men's souls. These faiths and Christianity, which is essentially Manichaean, assured their followers that the good spirit would win in the end, but of this consummation history offers no guarantee. Nature and history do not agree with our conceptions of good and bad. They define good as that which survives and bad as that which goes under, and the universe has no prejudice in favour of Christ as against Genghis Khan. The growing awareness of man's minuscule place in the cosmos has furthered the impairment of religious belief. In Christendom we may date the beginning of the decline to Copernicus, 1543. The process was slow, but by 1611 John Donne was mourning that the earth had become a mere suburb in the world and that new philosophy calls all in doubt and Francis Bacon, while tipping his hat occasionally to the bishops, was proclaiming science as the religion of modern eman emancipated man. In that generation began the death of God as an external deity. So great an effect required many cases, oh sorry, so great an effect required many causes besides the spread of science and historical knowledge. First, the Protestant Reformation, which originally defended private judgment. Then the multitude of Protestant sects and conflicting theologies, each appealing to both scriptures and reason. Then the higher criticism of the Bible, displaying that marvellous library as the imperfect work of fallible men. Then the deistic movement in England, reducing religion to a vague belief in God, hardly distinguishable from nature. Then the growing acquaintance with other religions whose myths, many of them pre-Christian, were distressingly similar to the supposedly factual basis of one's inherited creed.
Then the Protestant exposure of Catholic miracles, the deistic exposure of biblical miracles, the general exposure of frauds, inquisitions and massacres in the history of religion. Then the replacement of agriculture which had stirred men to faith by the annual rebirth of life and the mystery growth with industry, humming daily a litany of machines and suggesting a world machine. And meanwhile the bold advance of sceptical scholarship as in Bale and of pantheistic philosophy as in Spinoza, the massive attacks of the French Enlightenment upon Christianity, the revolt of Paris against the Church during the French Revolution, add in our own time the indiscriminate slaughter of civilian populations in modern war, Finally, the awesome triumphs of scientific technology, promising man omnipotence and destruction, and challenging the divine command of the skies. In one way, Christianity lent a hand against itself by developing in many Christians a moral sense that could no longer stomach the vengeful God of the traditional theology. The idea of hell disappeared from educated thought, even from pulpit homilies. Presbyterians became ashamed of the Westminster Confession, which had pledged them to a belief in God, who had created billions of men and women, despite his foreknowledge that, regardless of their virtues and crimes, they were predestined to everlasting hell. Educated Christians visiting the Sistine Chapel were shocked by Michelangelo's picture of Christ hurling offenders pell-mell into an inferno whose fires were never to be extinguished. Was this the gentle Jesus, meek and mild, who, has in, who had inspired our youth? Just as the moral development of the Hellenes had weakened their belief in the quarrelsome and adulterous deities of Olympus, a certain proportion of mankind, wrote Plato, do not believe at all in the existence of the gods. So the development of the Christian ethic slowly eroded Christian theology. Christ destroyed Jehovah. The replacement of Christian with secular institutions is the culminating and critical result of the Industrial Revolution. That state should attempt to dispense with theological support is one of the many crucial experiments that bewilder our brains and unsettle our ways today. Laws which were once presented as the decrees of a God-given king are now frankly the confused commands of fallible men. Education, which was the sacred province of God-inspired priests, becomes the task of men and women short of theological robes and awe and relying on reason and persuasion to civilise young rebels who fear only the policeman and may never learn to reason at all. Colleges once allied to churches have been captured by businessmen and scientists. The propaganda of patriotism, capitalism or communism succeeds to the inculcation of a supernatural creed and moral code. Holy days give way to holidays. Theatres are full even on Sundays. And even on Sundays, churches are half empty. In Anglo-Saxon families, religion has become a social observance and protective coloration. In American Catholic families it flourishes. In upper and middle class France and Italy, religion is a secondary sexual characteristic of the female. A thousand signs proclaim that Christianity is undergoing the same decline that fell upon the old Greek religion after the coming of the Sophists and the Greek Enlightenment. Catholicism survives because it appeals to imagination, hope and the senses because its mythology consoles and brightens the lives of the poor and because the command fertility of the faithful slowly regains the lands lost to the reformation catholicism has sacrificed the adherence of the intellectual community and suffers increasing defections through contact with secular education and literature but it wins convert from souls wearied with the uncertainty of reason and from others hopeful that the church will stem internal disorder and the communist wave. If another great war should devastate Western civilization, the resultant destruction of cities, the dissemination of poverty and the disgrace of science may leave the church as in AD 476, the sole hope and guide of those who survived the cataclysm. One lesson of history is that religion has many lives and a habit of resurrection. How often in the past have God and religion died and been reborn? 
Ikhanaton used all the powers of a pharaoh to destroy the religion of Ammon. Within a year, Ikhnaton's death, the religion of Ammon was restored. Atheism ran wild in the India of Buddha's youth, and Buddha himself found in a, re a religion without a god. After his death, Buddhism developed a complex theology, including gods, saints, and hell. Philosophy, science, and education depopulated the Hellenic pantheon, but the vacuum attracted a dozen Oriental faiths, rich in resurrection myths. In 1793, Herbert and Chaumet were wrongly interpreting Voltaire, established in Paris the ascetic worship of the goddess of reason. A year later, Robespierre, fearing chaos and inspired by Rousseau, set up the worship of the supreme being. In 1801, Napoleon, versed in history, signed a, con a concordat with Pius VII, restoring the Catholic Church in France. The irreligion of 18th century England disappeared under the Victorian compromise with Christianity. The state agreed to support the Anglican Church, and the educated classes would muffle their scepticism on the tacit understanding that the Church would accept subordination to the state, and the parson would humbly serve the squire. In America, the rationalism of the founding fathers gave place to a religious revival in the 19th century. Puritanism and paganism, the repression and the expression of the senses and desires alternate in mutual reaction in history. Generally, religion and puritanism prevail in periods when the laws are feeble and morals must bear the burden of maintaining social order. Skepticism and paganism, other factors being equal, progress as the rising power of law and government permits the decline of the church, the family and morality, without basically endangering the stability of the state. In our time, the strength of the state has united with the several forces listed above to relax faith and morals and to allow paganism to resume its natural sway. Probably our excesses will bring another reaction. Moral disorder may generate a religious revival. Atheists may again, as in France after the debacle of 1870, send their children to Catholic schools to give them the discipline of religious belief. Hear the appeal to the agnostic Renan in 1866. Let us enjoy the liberty of the sons of God, but let us take care lest we become accomplices in the diminution of virtue which would menace society if Christianity were to grow weak. What should we do without it? If rationalism wishes to govern the world without regard to the religious needs of the soul, the experience of the French Revolution is there to teach us the consequences of such a blunder. Does history warrant Renan's conclusion that religion is necessary to morality, that a natural ethic is too weak to withstand the savagery that lurks under civilization and emerges in our dreams, crimes and wars? Joseph de Mestre answered, I do not know what the heart of a rascal may be. I know what is in the heart of an honest man. It is horrible. There is no significant example in history before our time of a society successfully maintaining moral life without the aid of religion. France, France, the United States and some other nations have divorced their governments from all churches, but they have the help of religion in keeping social order. Only a few communist states have not merely dissociated themselves from religion, but have repudiated its aid, and perhaps the apparent and provisional success of this experiment in Russia owes much to the temporary acceptance of communism as the religion, or as sceptics would say, the opium of the people, replacing the church as the vendor of comfort and hope. If the socialist regime should fail in its efforts to destroy relative poverty among the masses, this new religion may lose its fervour and efficacy, and the state may wink at the restoration of supernatural beliefs as an aid in quieting discontent. As long as there is poverty, there will be gods. Hello there, Nicholas. How are you, my friend? Welcome. Chapter 8. Economics and History History, according to Karl Marx, is economics in action. 
the contest among individuals, groups, classes and states for food, fuel, materials and economic power. Political forms, religious institutions, cultural reactions are all rooted in economic realities. So the Industrial Revolution brought with it democracy, feminism, birth control, socialism, the decline of religion, the loosening of morals, the liberation of literature from dependence upon aristocratic patronage, the replacement of romanticism by realism in fiction, and the economic interpretation of history. The outstanding personalities in these movements were effects, not causes. Agamemnon, Achilles and Hector would never have been heard of had not the Greeks sought commercial control of the Dardanelles, economic ambition, not the face of Helen, fairer than the evening air, clad in the beauty of a thousand stars, launched a thousand ships on Ilium. Those subtle Greeks knew how to cover naked economic truth with the fig leaf of a phrase. Oh yeah, you said, um, you excited to get into that then, Nicholas, yeah? Have you read any other, um, Gnostic texts? Unquestionably, the economic interpretation illuminates much history. The money of the Delian Confederacy built the Parthenon. The treasury of Cleopatra's Egypt revitalised the exhausted Italy of Augustus, gave Virgil an annuity and Horace a farm. The Crusades, like the wars of Rome with Persia, were attempts of the West to capture trade routes to the East. The discovery of America was a result of the failure of the Crusades. The banking house of the Medici financed the Florentine Renaissance. The trade and industry of Nuremberg made Dura possible. The French Revolution came not because Voltaire wrote brilliant satires and Rousseau sentimental romances, but because the middle classes had risen to economic leadership, needed legislative freedom for their enterprise and trade, and itched for social acceptance and political power. <laughs> yes, Kimberly, I, I think you're right. It's uh, what I'm what I'm learning more and more as I read and what I learn more and more, Kimberly, as I learn more and more, and I don't know what you guys think, is that nothing is black and white. It's all very complicated and um, my studies of religion generally I've, I sort of follow a, a perennial or syncretic um, view of the similarities I like to find all the similarities in all the religions like um, they've just said here but also recently becoming a bit more interested in politics and uh, you know um, geopolitics and the world order and stuff there's no right answer a, a, a good statesman could argue for either side and someone, a charismatic person, could argue for both sides. And so, um, yeah, it's very grey. But uh, yeah, have a safe trip to school and back, Kimberley, and enjoy the catch-up later. Marx did not claim that individuals were always actuated by economic interest. He was far from imagining the material considerations led to Abelard's romance or the gospel of Buddha or the poems of Keats. But perhaps he underestimated the role played by non-economic incentives in the behaviour of masses, by religious fervour as in Muslim or Spanish armies, by nationalistic ardour as in Hitler's troops or Japan's kamikazes, by the self-fertilising fury of mobs as in the Gordon riots of June the 2nd to 8th, 1780 in London, or the massacres of September the 2nd to the 7th in 1792 in Paris. In such cases, the motives of the usually hidden leaders may be economic, but the result is largely determined by the passions of the mass. In many instances, political or military power was apparently the cause rather than the result of economic operations, as in the seizure of Russia by the Bolsheviks in 1917, or in the army coups that punctuate South American history. Who would claim that the Moorish conquest of Spain, or the Mongol conquest of Western Asia, or the Mughal conquest of India was the product of economic power? 
In these cases, the poor proved stronger than the rich. Military victory gave political ascendancy, which brought economic control. The generals could write a military interpretation of history. Allowing for these cautions, we may derive endless instruction from the economic analysis of the past. We observe that the invading barbarians found Rome weak because the agricultural population which had formerly supplied the legions with hardy and patriotic warriors fighting for land had been replaced by slaves labouring listlessly on vast farms owned by one man or a few. Today, the inability of small farms to use the best machinery profitably is again forcing agriculture into large-scale production under capitalistic or communistic ownership. It was once said that civilization is a parasite on the man with the hoe, but the man with the hoe no longer exists. He is now a hand at the wheel of a tractor or a combine. Agriculture becomes an industry, and soon the farmer must choose between being the employee of a capitalist and being the employee of a state. <coughs> at the other end of the scale, history reports that the men who can manage men manage the men who can manage only things, and the men who can manage money manage all. So the bankers watching the trends in agriculture, industry and trade, inviting the directing inviting and directing the flow of capital, putting our money doubly and trebly to work, controlling loans and interest and enterprise, running great risks to make financial gains rise to the top of the economic pyramid. From the Medici of Florence and the Fuggers of Augsburg to the Rothschilds of Paris and London and the Morgans of New York, bankers have sat in the councils of governments, financing wars and popes and occasionally sparking a revolution. Perhaps it is one secret of their power that, having studied the fluctuations of prices, they know that history is inflationary and that money is the last thing a wise man will hoard. The experience of the past leaves little doubt that every economic system must sooner or later rely upon some form of the profit motive to stir individuals and groups to productivity. Substitutes like slavery, police supervision or ideological enthusiasm prove too unproductive, too expensive or too transient. Normally and generally, men are judged by their ability to produce, except in war, when they are ranked according to their ability to destroy. Since practical ability differs from person to person, the majority of such abilities in nearly all societies is gathered in a minority of men. The concentration of wealth is a natural result of this concentration of ability and regularly recurs in history. The rate of concentration varies, other factors being equal, with the economic freedom permitted by morals and the laws. Despotism may for a time retard the concentration, democracy allowing the most liberty accelerates it. The relative equality of Americans before 1776 has been overwhelmed by a thousand forms of physical, mental and economic differentiation, so that the gap between the wealthiest and the poorest is now greater than at any time since imperial plutocratic Rome. In progressive societies, the concentration may reach a point where the strength of number in the many poor rivals, the strength of the ability in the few rich, when the unstable equilibrium generates a critical situation which history has diversely met by legislation redistributing wealth or by revolution distributing poverty. In the Athens of 594 BC, according to Plutarch, the disparity of fortune between the rich and the poor had reached its height, so that the city seemed to be in a dangerous condition, and no other means for freeing it from disturbances seemed possible but despotic power. The poor, finding their status worsened with each year, the government in the hands of their masters, and the corrupt courts deciding every issue against them, began to talk of violent revolt. The rich, angry and the cha at the challenge to their poverty, sorry, the rich, angry at the challenge to their property, prepared to defend themselves by force. Good sense prevailed. Moderate elements secured the election of Solon, a businessman of aristocratic lineage, to the supreme anchorship. He devaluated the currency, thereby easing the burden of all debtors, though he himself was a creditor. 
He reduced all personal debts and ended imprisonment for debt. He cancelled arrears for taxes and mortgage interest. He established a, a graduated income tax that made the rich pay at a rate 12 times that required by the poor. He recognised the courts on a more popular basis, and he arranged that the sons of those who had died in war for Athens should be brought up and educated at the government's expense. The rich protested that his measures were outright confiscation. The radicals complained that he had not redivided the land, but with a generation almost all agreed that his reforms had saved Athens from revolution. The Roman Senate, so famous for its wisdom, adopted an uncompromising course when the concentration of wealth approached an explosive point in Italy. The result was a hundred years of class and civil war. Tiberius Gracchus, an aristocrat elected as tribune of the people, proposed to redistribute land by limiting ownership to 333 acres per person and allotting surplus land to the restive proletariat of the capital. The Senate rejected his proposals as confiscatory. He appealed to the people, telling them, You fight and die to give wealth and luxury to others. You are called the masters of the world, but there is not a foot of ground that you can call your own. Contrary to Roman law, he campaigned for re-election as tribune in an election day riot. He was slain in 133 BC. His brother, Caius, taking up his cause, failed to prevent a renewal of violence and ordered his servant to kill him. The slave obeyed and then killed himself, 121 BC. Three thousand of Caius's followers were put to death by senatorial decree. Marius became the leader of the plebs, but withdrew when the movement verged on revolution. Catiline, proposing to abolish all debts, organised the revolutionary army of wretched paupers. He was inundated by Cicero's angry eloquence and died in battle against the state in 62 BC. Julius Caesar attempted a compromise but was cut down by the P patricians in 44 BC after five years of civil war. Mark Antony confused his support of Caesar's policies with personal ambitions and romance. Octavius defeated him at Actium and established the Principate that, for 210 years, maintained the Pax Romana between the classes as well as among the states within the imperial frontiers. After the breakdown of political order in Western Roman Empire, centuries of destruction were followed by the slow renewal and reconcent reconcentration of wealth, partly in the hierarchy of the Catholic Church. In one aspect, the Reformation was a redistribution of this wealth by the reduction of German and English payments to the Roman Church and by the secular appropriation of ecclesiastical property and revenues. The French Revolution attempted a violent redistribution of wealth by jacquiers in the countryside and massacres in the cities, but the chief result was the transfer of property and privilege from the aristocracy to the bourgeoisie. The government of the United States in 1933-52 to and 1960-65 to followed Solon's peaceful methods and accomplished a moderate and pacifying redistribution. Perhaps someone had studied history. The upper classes in America cursed, complied and resumed the concentration of wealth. We conclude that the concentration of wealth is natural and inevitable and is periodically alleviated by violent or peaceable partial redistribution. In this view, all the economic history is the slow heartbeat of the social organism, a vast systole, of diastole, a systole and diastole of concentrating wealth and compulsive recirculation. So another really... Uh, interesting chapter there because yeah it's just just such interesting points I wonder um how thick these books are I'm going to actually have a look um wait there a moment guys uh you do your own googling if you want but I want to just have a look quickly at um how these books look um the Story of Civilization, Will and Ariel Durant. So bear with me because I'm just curious, you know, because you can get loads of little tidbits and um, 
like anecdotes from here, but it's no, there's nothing like a, a an in depth study. Um, what was it called? Sorry, this isn't very interesting, um, but I just want to look the story of civilization. I might not even sell it here. Yeah, here we go. The story of civilization. Will Durant. All volumes. Wow. Hardcover set. Yeah, maybe it's best to go on um, thingy. But here's a... Um... Oh, man. It's beautiful. Here they are with the... Um... The spines on. <laughs> I'm going to try and show you. Pretty, uh, pretty voluminous, but super interesting. I imagine you you do that, and you've got a uh, you've got a, an education in history if you read that. And I'm very interested in this next chapter, as it goes, because this chapter, chapter 9, is called Socialism and History. And I've been dabbling in socialist ideas recently because I'm a member of a union. I'm a postman, if you didn't know, work for Raw Mail here in the UK. And we've been on strike uh, many times in the last six months, 18 days to be precise, if you're interested. And so it makes me think about... I mean, there's Marxism, then socialism and communism, and then there's um, unionization and all these other things, and then there's the vast spectrum of political, um, yeah, the the scale, and it's just very interesting to um, consider these things. Of course, there's no black and white; there's only grey, and it's it feels to me that it's individuals' points of view that makes their political world view have weight and some people they are dogmatic about their beliefs and they won't move whereas myself you make a good argument and, and I'll listen to that so I'm um, yeah very interested in here to see what these great authors and scholars have to say about that so chapter 10 socialism and history Yeah, that's what I mean, um, Kathy. Hello there, nice to see you. And sorry, I'll just uh, answer Kathy quickly. That's the thing, isn't it? All of these words have um, they've sort of changed their meaning now. They they mean something different now to what maybe they were meant to mean at, at the beginning. And and all this um, you've got Marxism, communism, and now you've got uh, sort of social Marxism and neo-Marxism and cultural Marxism and all these other things and it's all very confusing if you're just looking on the surface you know I imagine these guys Will and Ariel Durant would be deep in the weeds and and be able to make arguments to, for and against but yeah I mean same like anyone who's um, suffered in a communist country right if you try and say oh yeah it might be a good idea <laughs> they uh, they're not gonna they're not going to be very interested in listening to you, especially, uh, what's the term I found on strike, um, the champagne socialists, you know, where you, you're just in the ideas, again, like the Gurdjieff Ospensky stuff, Cathy, the, the, the intellectual pursuits is different from the, um, the, the, the grassroots sort of working towards changing the world. But anyway, let me get down off my soapbox and get back to reading. Socialism and history. The struggle of socialism against capitalism is part of the historic rhythm in the concentration and dispersion of wealth. The capitalist, of course, has fulfilled a creative function in history. He has gathered the savings of the people into productive capital by the promise of dividends or interest. He has financed the mechanization of industry and agriculture and the rationalization of distribution, and the result has been such a flow of goods from producer to consumer has history as never seen before. Couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> 
<laughs> he has put the liberal gospel of liberty to his use by arguing that businessmen left relatively free from transportation tolls and legislative regulation can give the public a greater abundance of food, homes, comfort and leisure than has ever come from industries managed by politicians, manned by governmental employees and supposedly immune to the laws of supply and demand. In free enterprise, the spur of competition and the zeal and zest of ownership arouse the productiveness and inventiveness of men. Nearly every economic ability sooner or later finds its niche and reward in the shuffle of talents and the natural selection of skills. And a basic democracy rules the process in so far as most of the articles to the produced and the services to be rendered are determined by public demand rather than by government decree. Meanwhile, competition compels the capitalist to exhaustive labour and his products to ever-rising excellence. There is much truth in such claims today, but they do not explain why history so resounds with protests and revolts against the abuses of industrial mastery, price manipulation, business chicanery and irresponsible wealth. These abuses must be hoary with age, for there have been socialistic experiments in a dozen countries in centuries. We read that in Sumeria, about 2100 BC, there's nothing new under the sun. I don't know who says that quote, but it's a famous quote. There's nothing new under the sun. And so here, I don't know where this comes from, Hammurabi perhaps, but we read that in Sumeria about 2100 BC, let's see what it has to say. The economy was organized by the state. Most of the arable land was the property of the crown. Labourers received rations from the crops delivered to the royal storehouses. For the administration of this vast state economy, a very differentiated hierarchy was developed, and records were kept of all deliveries and distributions of rations. Tens of thousands of clay tablets inscribed with such records were found in the capital Ur itself in Lagash, Umma. Foreign trade also was carried out in the name of the central administration. In Babylonia, circa 1750 BC, the law code of Hammurabi fixed wages for herdsmen and artisans and the charges to be made by physicians for operations. In Egypt, under the, Ptolemy under the Ptolemies, the state owned the soil and managed agriculture. The peasant was told what land to till, what crops to grow, his harvest was measured and registered by government scribes, was threshed on royal threshing floors and was conveyed by a living chain of fellahin into the granaries of the king. The government owned the mines and appropriated the ore. It nationalised the production and sale of oil, salt, papyrus and textiles. All commerce was controlled and regulated by the state. Most retail trade was in the hands of state agents selling state-produced goods. Banking was a government monopoly, but its operation might be delegated to private firms. Taxes were laid upon every person, industry, process, product, sale and legal document. To keep track of taxable transactions and income, the government maintained a swarm of scribe, scribes and a complex system of personal and property registration. The revenue of this system made the Ptolemaic, Ptolemaic the richest state of the time. Great engineering enterprises were completed, agriculture was improved and a large proportion of the profits went to develop and adorn the country and to finance its cultural life. About 290 BC the famous museum on, and library of Alexandria were founded. Wow, 290 BC it was founded the Library of Alexandria. Science and literature flourished. At uncertain dates in this Ptolemaic era, some scholars made the Septuagint, or Septuagint, translation of the Pentateuch into Greek. Soon, however, the pharaohs took to expensive wars, and after 246 BC, they gave themselves to drink and venery, allowing the administration of the state and the economy to fall into the hands of rascals who ground every possible penny out of the poor. Generation after generation, the government's exactions grew, strikes increased in number and violence 
In the capital, Alexandria, the populace was bribed to peace by bounties and spectacles, but it was watched by a large military force, was allowed no voice in the government and became in the end a violent mob. Agriculture and industry decayed through lack of incentive, moral disintegration spread and order was not restored until Octavius brought Egypt under Roman rule in 30 BC. <laughs> Yes, Kathy. Plato, um, Plato knew best. Uh, th he's mentioned a few times, and I've got the book upstairs. Actually, uh, the Peloponnesian War. I think when uh, Sparta defeated Greece, and and that's another thing. I, I've I've put uh, I put a video up the other day, didn't I? Uh, let's read something different, or should we read something different? Which has given us this historical book, but. We've got uh, Herodotus's histories, we've got the Peloponnesian War, we've got the Iliad and the Odyssey, and we've got, I could, I'd love to reread Plato here live, but we've got so many, um, yeah, just so many beautiful books that we can read, but yeah, we just keep going, just keep going. Um, where did I stop? read that anyway i'll read that bit again because i don't know if i did generation after generation the government's exactions grew strikes increased in number and violence in the capital alexandria the populace was bribed to peace by bounties and spectacles but it was watched by a large military force was allowed no voice in the government and became in the end a violent mob Agriculture and industry decayed through lack of incentive, moral disintegration spread and order was not re restored until Octavius brought Egypt under Roman rule in 30 BC, I think I did read that bit. Rome had its socialist interlude under Diocletian, or Diocletian maybe, faced with increasing poverty and restlessness among the masses and with imminent danger of barbarian invasion, he issued in AD 301 an Edictum de Pretis, which denounced monopolists for keeping goods from the market to raise prices and set maximum prices and wages for all important articles and services. Extensive public works were undertaken to put the unemployed to work and food was distributed gratis or at reduced prices to the poor. The government, which already owned most mines, quarries and salt deposits, brought nearly all major industries and guilds under detailed control. In every large town, we are told, the state became a powerful employer, standing head and shoulders above the private industrialists, who were in any case crushed by taxation. When businessmen predicted ruin, Diocletian explained that the barbarians were at the gate and that individual liberty had to be shelved until collective liberty could be made secure. The socialism of Diocletian was a war economy, made possible by fear of foreign attack. Other factors equal internal liberty varies inversely as external danger. The task of controlling men in economic detail proved too much for Diocletian's expanding, expensive and corrupt bureaucracy. To support this officialdom, the army, the court, public works and the dole, taxation rose to such heights that men lost incentive to work or earn, and an erosive contest began between lawyers finding devices to evade taxes and lawyers formulating laws to prevent evasion. Thousands of Romans, to escape the tax-gatherer, fled over the frontiers to seek refuge among the barbarians. Seeking to check this elusive mobility and to facilitate regulation and taxation, the government issued decrees binding the peasant to his field and the worker to his shop until all his debts and taxes had been paid. In this and other ways, medieval serfdom began. Oh dear. China has had several attempts at state socialism. Zhu Ma BC 145 informs us that to prevent private individuals from reserving their sole use, the riches of the mountains and the sea, in order to gain a fortune and from putting the lower classes into subjection to themselves, 
The Emperor Wu Ti nationalised the resources of the soil, extended governmental direction over transport and trade, laid a tax upon incomes and established public works, including canals that bound the rivers together and irrigated the fields. The state accumulated stockpiles of goods, sold these when prices were rising, bought more when prices were falling. Thus says Zuma Qian, the rich merchants, merchants and large shopkeepers would be prevented from making big profits and prices would be regulated in the empire. For a time, we are told, China prospered as never before. A combination of acts of God with human deviltry put to an end to the experiment after the death of the emperor. Floods alternated with droughts, created tragic shortages and raised prices beyond control. Businessmen protested that taxes were making them support the lazy and the incompetent. Harassed by the high cost of living, the poor joined the rich in clamouring for a return to the old ways, and some proposed that the inventor of the new system be boiled alive. The reforms were one by one rescinded and were almost forgotten when they were revived by a Chinese philosopher king. Wang Mang, AD 9-23, was an accomplished scholar, a patron of literature, a millionaire who scattered his riches among his friends and the poor. Having seized the throne, he surrounded himself with men trained in letters, science and philosophy. He nationalised the land, divided it into, into equal tracts among the peasants and put an end to slavery. Like Wu Ti, he tried to control prices by the accumulation or release of stockpiles. He made loans at low interest to private enterprise. The groups whose profits had been clipped by his legislation united to plot his fall. They were helped by drought and flood and foreign invasion. The rich Lu family put itself at the head of a general rebellion, slew Wang Mang and repealed his legislation. Everything was as before. A thousand years later, Wang An Shi, as premier, undertook a, a pervasive governmental domination of the Chinese economy. The state, he held, should take the entire management of commerce, industry and agriculture into its own hands with a view to succouring the working classes and preventing them from being ground into the dust by the rich. He rescued the peasants from the moneylenders by loans at low interest. He encouraged new set settlers by advancing them seed and other aid to be repaid out of the later yield of their land. He organised great engineering works to control floods and check unemployment. Boards were appointed in every district to regulate wages and prices. Commerce was nationalised. Pensions were provided for the aged, the unemployed and the poor. Education and the examination system by which admission to governmental offices was determined were reformed. Pupils threw away their textbooks of rhetoric, says a Chinese historian, and began to study primers of history, geography and political economy. What undermined the experiment? First, high taxes laid upon all to finance a swelling band of governmental employees. Second, conscription of, male, of a male in every family to man the armies made necessary by barbarian invasion. Third, corruption in the bureaucracy. China, like other nations, was faced with a choice between private plunder and public graft. Conservatives, led by Wang An Shi's brother, argued that human corruptibility and incompetence make governmental control of industry impracticable, and that the best economy is a laissez-faire system that relies on the natural impulses of men. The rich, stung by the high taxation of their fortunes and the monopoly of commerce by the government, poured out their resources in a campaign to discredit the new system, to obstruct its enforcement and to bring it to an end. This movement, well organised, exerted constant pressure upon the emperor. 
when another period of drought and flood was capped by the appearance of a terrifying comet, the son of heaven dismissed Wang and Shi, revoked his decrees, and called the opposition to power. The longest-lasting regime of socialism yet known to history was set up by the Incas in what we now call Peru at some time in the 13th century, basing... See, now, I never, that's, I never knew that, that the Incas were socialist, basing their power largely on popular belief that the earthly sovereign was the delegate of the sun god, the Incas organised and directed all agriculture, labour and trade. A governmental census kept account of materials, individuals and income. Professional runners, using a remarkable system of roads, maintained the network of communication indispensable to such detailed rule over so large a territory. Every person was an employee of the state and seems to have accepted this condition cheerfully as a promise of security and food. This system endured till the conquest of Peru by Pizarro in 1533. On the opposite slope of South America in a Portuguese colony along the Uruguay River, 150 50 Jesuits organised 200,000 Indians into another socialistic society. The ruling priest managed nearly all agriculture, commerce and industry. They allowed each youth to choose among the trades they taught, but they required every able-bodied person to work eight hours a day. They provided for recreation, arranged sports, dances and choral performances of a thousand voices and trained orchestras that played European music. They served also as teachers, physicians and judges and devised a penal code that exclu excluded capital punishment. By all accounts, the natives were docile and content, and when the community was attacked, it defended itself with an ardour and ability that surprised the assailants. In 1750, Portugal ceded to Spain territory including seven of the Jesuit settlements. A rumour having spread that the lands of these colonies contained gold, the Spanish in America insisted on immediate occupation. The Portuguese government, under Pompal, Pombal, sorry, then at odds with the Jesuits, ordered the priests and the natives to leave the settlements, and after some resistance by the Indians, the experiment came to an end. In the social revolt that accompanied the Protestant Reformation in Germany, communistic slogans based on the Bible were advanced by several rebel leaders. Thomas Munzer, a preacher, called upon the people to overthrow the princes, the clergy and the capitalists and to establish the refined society in which all things were to be in common. He recruited an army of peasants, inspired them with accounts of communism among the apostles and led them to battle. They were defeated. 5,000 of them were slain. Munzer was beheaded in 1525. Hans Hut, accepting Munzer's teachings, organised in Austerlitz an Anabaptist community that practised communism for almost a century. John of Leyden led a group of Anabaptists in capturing control of Munster, the capital of Westphalia. There, for 14 months, they maintained a communistic regime. In the 17th century, a group of levellers in Cromwell's army begged him in vain to establish a communistic utopia in England. The socialist agitation subsided during the Restoration, but it rose again when the Industrial Revol Revolution revealed the greed and brutality of early capitalism. Child labour, woman labour, long hours, low wages and disease-breeding factories and slums. Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels gave the movement its Magna Carta in the Communist Manifesto in 1847 and its Bible in Das Kapital. They expected that socialism would be affected first in England because industry was there most developed and had reached a stage of centralised management that seemed to invite appropriation by the government. They did not live long enough to be surprised by the outbreak of communism in Russia. Why did modern socialism come first in a Russia where capitalism was in its infancy and there was no large corporations to ease the transition of state control? Centuries of peasant poverty and reams of intellectual revolt had prepared the way, but the peasants had been freed from serfdom in 1861 and the intellectuals had been inclined towards an anarchism antipodal to an all-absorbing state.
Probably the Russian Revolution of 1917 succeeded because the Tsarist government had been defeated and disgraced by war and bad management. The Russian economy had collapsed in chaos. The peasants returned from the front carrying arms and Lenin and Trotsky had been given safe conduct and bon voyage by the German government. The revolution took a communistic form because the new state was challenged by internal disorder and external attack. The people reacted as any nation will react under siege. It put aside all individual freedom until order and security could be restored. Here too, communism was a war economy. Perhaps it survives through continued fear of war. Given a generation of peace, it would presumably be eroded by the nature of man. Socialism in Russia is now restoring individualistic motives to give its system greater productive stimulus and to allow its people more physical and intellectual liberty. Meanwhile, capitalism undergoes a correlative process of limiting individualistic acquisition by semi-socialistic legislation and the redistribution of wealth through the welfare state. Marx was an unfaithful disciple of Hegel. He interpreted the Hegelian dialectic as implying that the struggle between capitalism and socialism would end in the complete victory of socialism. But if the Hegelian formula of thesis, antithesis and synthesis is applied to the industrial revolution as thesis and to capitalism versus socialism as antithesis, the third condition would be a synthesis of capitalism and socialism and to this reconciliation the Western world visibly moves. Year by year the role of Western governments in the economy rises, the share of the private sector declines, capitalism retains the stimulus of private property, free enterprise and competition and produces a rich supply of goods, high taxation falling heavily upon the upper classes, enables the government to provide for a self-limited population unprecedented services in education, health and recreation. The fear of capitalism has compelled socialism to widen freedom and the fear of socialism has compelled capitalism to increase equality. East is West and West is East and soon the twain will meet. Yeah, really good. Like I say, it's, it's no storybook, is it? But again, it, it's something different, isn't it? So... We have to um, have to branch out occasionally and read something different. Um, And yeah, that bit at the end is, is like I was saying before on my soapbox about socialism and, and the striking posties. Um, I think that last section there is the, um, is the best way to put at it, that they uh, are offsetting each other. Socialism offsets capitalism and capitalism offsets socialism. And so, yeah, the, the, the two... Um, Thesis, antithesis, synthesis, as Hegel would say. Uh, hello there, Jean Green. Here I am. How are you doing? Welcome to a live read. As you can probably see from the title, we're reading the lessons of history. And we've arrived at chapter 10, Government and History. Alexander Pope thought that only a fool would dispute over forms of government. History has a good word to say for all of them, and for government in general. Since men love freedom, and the freedom of individuals in society requires some regulation of conduct, the first condition of freedom is its limitation. Make it absolute, and it dies in chaos. So the prime task of government is to establish order. Organised central force is the sole alternative to incalculable and disruptive force in private hands. Power naturally converges to a centre, for it is ineffective when divided, diluted and spread, as in Poland under the liberum veto. Hence, the centralisation of power in the monarchy by Richelieu or Bismarck over the protest of feudal barons has been praised by historians. 
a similar process has centred centered power in the federal government in the United States. It was of no use to talk of states' rights when the economy was ignoring state boundaries and could be regulated only by some central authority. Today, international government is developing as industry, commerce and finance override frontiers and take international forms. Monarchy seems to be the most natural kind of government, since it applies to the group the authority of the father in a family, or of the chieftain in a warrior band. If we were to judge forms of government from their prevalence and duration in history, we should have to give the palm to monarchy. Democracies, by contrast, have been hectic interludes. After the breakdown of Roman democracy and the class wars of the Gracchi, Marius and Caesar, Augustus organised under what in effect was monarchical rule, the greatest achievement in the history of statesmanship. That Pax Romana, which maintained peace from 30 BC to AD 180, throughout an empire ranging from the Atlantic to the Euphrates and from Scotland to the Black Sea. After him, monarchy disgraced itself under Caligula, Nero and Domitian. But after them came Nerva, Trajan, Hadrian, Antonius Pius and Marcus Aurelius, the finest succession of good and great sovereigns, Raynan called them, that the world has ever had. If, said Gibbon, a man were called upon to fix the period during which the condition of the human race was most happy and prosperous, he would without hesitation name that which elapsed from the accession of Nerva to the death of Marcus Aurelius. Their united reigns are possible on the only period of history in which the happiness of a great people was the sole object of government. In that brilliant age when Rome's subjects complimented themselves on being under her rule, monarchy was adoptive. The emperor transmitted his authority not to his offspring, but to the ablest man he could find. He adopted this man as, as his son, trained him in the functions of government and gradually surrendered to him the reins of power. The system worked well, partly because neither Trajan nor Hadrian had a son, and the son of Antonius Pius died in childhood. Marcus Aurelius had a son, Commodus, who succeeded him because the philosopher failed to name another an heir. Soon, chaos was king. See Gladiator. <laughs> all in all, monarchy has had a middling record. Its wars of succession brought mankind as much evil as the continuity or legitimacy of the monarchy brought good. When it is hereditary, it is likely to be more prolific of stupidity nepotism, irresponsibility and extravagance than of nobility or statesmanship. Louis the Fourteenth has often been taken as the paragon of modern monarchs, but the people of France rejoiced at his death. The complexity of contemporary states seems to break down any single mind that tries to master it. Hence, most governments have been oligarchies, ruled by a minority, chosen either by birth, as in aristocracies, or by religious organisation, as in theocracies, or by wealth, as in democracies. It is unnatural, as even Rousseau saw, for a majority to rule, for a majority can seldom be organised for united and specific action, and a minority can. If the majority of abilities is contained in a minority of men, minority government is as inevitable as the concentration of wealth. The majority can do no more than periodically throw out one minority and set up another. The aristocrat holds that political selection by birth is the sanest alternative to selection by... Sorry, the old mic's fallen off. Hello, El Tell. Welcome back. Nice to see you. <clears throat> the aristocrat holds that political selection by birth is the sanest alternative to selection by money or theology or violence. Aristocracy withdraws a few men from the exhausting and coercing strife of economic competition and trains them from birth through example, surroundings and minor office for the tasks of government. These tasks require a special preparation that no ordinary family or background can provide. Aristocracy is not only a nursery of statesmanship, it is also a repository and vehicle of culture, manners, standards and tastes.
and serves thereby as a stabilising barrier to social fads, artistic crazes or neurotically rapid changes in the moral code. See what has happened to morals, manners, style and art since the French Revolution. Aristocracies have inspired, supported and controlled art, but they have rarely produced it. The aristocrat looks upon artists as manual labourers. He prefers the art of life to the life of art and would never think of reducing himself to the consuming toil that is usually the price of genius. He does not often produce literature for he thinks of writing for publication as exhibitionism and salesmanship. The result has been in modern aristocracies a careless and dilettante hedonism, a lifelong holiday in which the privileges of place were enjoyed to the full and the responsibilities were often ignored, hence the decay of some aristocracies. Only three generations intervene between la tête ses moi and après moi le déluge. So the services of aristocracy did not save it when it monopolised privilege and power too narrowly, when it oppressed the people with selfish and myopic exploitation, when it retarded the growth of the nation by a blind addiction to ancestral ways, when it consumed the men and resources of the state in the lordly sport of dynastic or territorial wars. Then the excluded banded together in wild revolt, the new rich combined with the poor against obstruction and stagnation, the guillotine cut off a thousand noble heads, and democracy took its turn in the misgovernment of mankind. Yeah, hey, thanks, El Tell. I'm very pleased about the 7K, and yeah, like you say, 10K's round the corner, let's hope. Does history justify revolutions? Hmm? This is an old debate, well illustrated by Luther's bold break from the Catholic Church versus Erasmus's plea for patient and orderly reform, or by Charles James Fox's stand for the French Revolution versus Edmund Burke's defence of prescription and continuity. In some cases, outworn and inflexible institutions seem to require violent overthrow, as in Russia in 1917. But in most instances, the effects achieved by the revolution would apparently have come without it through the gradual compulsion of economic developments. America would have become the dominant factor in the English-speaking world without any revolution. The French Revolution replaced the land-owning aristocracy with the money-controlling business class as the ruling power, but a similar result occurred in, the 19th, in 19th century England without bloodshed and without disturbing the public peace. To break sharply with the past is the, to court the madness that may follow the shock of sudden blows or mutilations. As the sanity of the individual lies in the continuity of his memories, so the sanity of a group lies in the continuity of its traditions. In either case, a break in the chain invites a neurotic reaction, as in the Paris massacres of September 1972. And yes, um, Mimi, good words in this one. I think you're right there, Mimi. It's uh, very interesting words and, and a lot to ponder. Since wealth is an order and procedure of production and exchange rather than an accumulation of mostly perishable goods and is a trust, the credit system in men and institutions rather than in the intrinsic value of paper money or checks, violent revolutions do not so much redistribute wealth as destroy it. There may be a redivision of the land, but the natural inequality of men soon recreates an inequality of possessions and privileges and raises to power a new minority with essentially the same instincts as in the old. The only real revolution is in the enlightenment of the mind and the improvement of character. The only real emancipation is individual, and the only real revolutionists are philosophers and saints. <laughs> Thanks, El Tell, and what an, another great sentence that is, or paragraph. In strict usage of the term, democracy has existed only in modern times, for the most part since the French Revolution. As male adult suffrage in the United States, it began under Andrew Jackson, 
as adult suffrage it began in our youth. In ancient Attica, out of a total population of 315,000 souls, 115,000 were slaves and only 43,000 were citizens with the right to vote. Women, nearly all working men, nearly all shopkeepers and tradesmen, and all resident aliens were excluded from the franchise. The citizen minority was divided into two factions, the oligarchic, chiefly the landed aristocracy and the upper bourgeoisie, and the democratic, small landowners and, and small businessmen, and citizens who had lapsed into wage labour but still retained the franchise. During the ascendancy of Pericles, 460 to 430 BC, the aristocracy prevailed and Athens had her supreme age in literature, drama and art. After his death and the disgrace of the aristocracy through the defeat of Athens in the Pleponesian War, 431 to 404 BC, the demos, or lower class of citizens, rose to power, much to the disgust of Socrates and Plato. From Solon to the Roman conquest of Greece, the conflict of oligarchs and democrats was waged with books, plays, orations, votes, ostracism, assassination and civil war. At uh, Corsica, now Corfu, in 427 BC, the ruling oligarchy assassinated 60 leaders of the popular party. The democrats overturned the oligarchs, tried 50 of them before a kind of committee of public safety, executed all 50 and starved hundreds of aristocratic prisoners to death. Thucydides', Thucydides description reminds us of Paris in 1792-93. During seven days of the Corycurians were engaged in butchering those of their fellow citizens whom they regarded as their enemies. Death raged in every shape and, as usually happens at such times, there was no length to which violence did not go. Sons were killed by their fathers and suppliants were dragged from the altar or slain on it. Revolution thus ran its course from city to city, and the places where it arrived last from having heard what had been done before carried to a still greater excess the atrocity of their reprisals. Corsica gave the first example of these crimes, of the revenge exacted by the governed who had never experienced equitable treatment or indeed aught but violence from their rulers and of the savage and pitiless excesses into which men were hurried by their passions. Meanwhile, the moderate part of the citizens perished between the two warring groups. The whole Hellenic world was convulsed. In his Republic, Plato made his mouthpiece, Socrates, condemn the triumphant democracy of Athens as a chaos of class violence, cultural decadence and moral degradation. The Democrats... By the time of Plato's death, his hostile analysis of Athenian democracy was approaching apparent confirmation by history. Athens recovered wealth, but this was now commercial rather than landed wealth. Industrialists, merchants and bankers were at the top of the reshuffled heap. The change produced a feverish struggle for money, a pleonexia, as the Greeks called it, an appetite for more and more. The nouveau riche, neoplutoi, built gaudy mansions, bedecked their women with costly robes and jewellery, spoiled them with dozens of servants, rivalled one another in the feasts with which they regaled their guests. The gap between the rich and the poor widened. Athens was divided, as Plato put it, into two cities. One, one the city of the poor and the other of the rich, the one at war with the other. The poor scheme to despoil the rich by legislation, taxation and revolution. The rich organised themselves for protection against the poor. The members of some oligarchic organisation, says Aristotle, took a solemn oath. I will be an adversary of the people, i.e. the commonality, and in the council I will do it all the evil that I can. The rich have become so unsocial, wrote Isocrates about 366 B.C., that those who own property had rather throw their possessions into the sea than lend aid to the needy, while those who are in poorer circumstances would less gladly find a treasure than seize the possessions of the rich. 
the poorer citizens captured control of the assembly and began to vote the money of the rich into the coffers of the state for redistribution among the people through governmental enterprises and subsidies. The politicians strained their ingenuity to discover... Sorry to discover new sources of public revenue. In some cities, the decentralising of wealth was more direct. The debtors in Mytilene massacred their creditors en masse. The Democrats of Argos fell upon the rich, killed hundreds of them, and confiscated their property. The moneyed families of otherwise hostile Greek states leagued themselves secretly for mutual aid against popular revolts. The middle classes, as well as the rich, began to distrust democracy as empowered envy, and the poor distrusted it as a sham, equality of votes nullified by a gaping inequality of wealth. The rising bitterness of the class war left Greece internally as well as internationally divided when Philip of Macedon pounced down upon it in, three, in 38, 338 BC, and many rich Greeks welcomed his coming as preferable to revolution. Athenian democracy disappeared under Macedonian dictatorship. Plato's reduction of political evolution to a sequence of monarchy, aristocracy, democracy and dictatorship found another illustration in the history of Rome. During the 3rd and 2nd centuries before Christ, <laughs> have a good class, Jean Green. <laughs> and uh, that's very kind of you to say. Howdy in Texas. Have a good day, my friend. During the 3rd and 2nd centuries before Christ, the Roman oligarchy organised a foreign policy and a disciplined army and conquered and exploited the Mediterranean world. The wealth so won was absorbed by the patricians and the commerce so developed raised to luxurious opulence, opulence the middle class. Conquered Greeks, Orientals and Africans were brought to Italy to serve as slaves on the Latifundia. The native farmers, displaced from the soil, joined the restless, breeding proletariat in the cities to enjoy the monthly dole of grain that Gaius Gracchus had secured for the poor in 123 BC. Generals and proconsuls returned from the provinces loaded with spoils for themselves and the ruling class. Millionaires multiplied. Mobile money replaced land as the source or instrument of political power. Rival factions competed in the wholesale purchase of candidates and votes. In 53 BC, one group of voters received 10 million sesterkers. What the hell is that word? Sesterses? For its support, sorry, a word I've never seen before in my life and I don't know how to pronounce it. When money failed, murder was available. Citizens who had voted the wrong way were in some instances beaten close to death and their houses were set on fire. Antiquity had never known so rich, so powerful and so corrupt a government. The aristocrats engaged Pompey to maintain their ascendancy. The commoners cast in their lot with Caesar, Ordeal of battle replaced the auctioning of victory. Caesar won and established a popular dictatorship. Aristocrats killed him, but ended by accepting the dictatorship of his grandnephew and stepson, Augustus. Democracy ended. Monarchy was restored. The platonic wheel had come full turn. We may infer from these classic examples that ancient democracy corroded with slavery, venality and war did not deserve the name and offers no fair test of popular government. In America, democracy had a wider base. It began with the advantage of a British heritage, Anglo-Saxon law which, from Magna Carta onward, had defended the citizens against the state, and Protestantism which had opened the way to religious and mental liberty. The American Revolution was not only a revolt of colonials against a distant government, it was also an uprising of a native middle class against an imported aristocracy. The rebellion was eased and quickened by an abundance of free land and a minimum of legislation. Men who owned the soil they tilled and, within the limits of nature, controlled the conditions under which they lived, had an economic footing for political freedom. 
Their personality and character were rooted in the earth. It was such men who made Jefferson president, I'm sorry, predecent, president, what the hell, I can't even say. It was such men who made Jefferson president, Jefferson who was as sceptical as Voltaire and as revolutionary as Rousseau. A government that governed least was admirably suited to liberate those individualistic energies that transformed America from a wilderness to a material utopia and from the child and ward to the rival and guardian of Western Europe. And while rural isolation enhanced the freedom of the individual, national isolation provided liberty and security with protective seas. These and a hundred other conditions gave to America a democracy more basic and universal than history had ever seen. Oh, hello there, Woody B. No problem, you can um, always go and catch up at your leisure. Many of these formative conditions have disappeared. Personal isolation is gone through the growth of cities. Personal independence is gone through the dependence of the worker upon tools and capital that he does not own, and upon conditions that he cannot control. War becomes more consuming, and the individual is helpless to understand its causes or to escape its effects. Free land is gone, though home ownership spreads, with a minimum of land. The once self-employed shopkeeper is in the toils of the big distributor, and may echo Marx's complaint that everything is in chains. Economic freedom, even in the middle classes, becomes more and more exceptional, making political freedom a consolatory, a consolatory pretense. And all this has come about not, as we thought in our hot youth, through the perversity of the rich, but through the impersonal fatality of economic development and through the nature of man. Every advance in the complexity of the economy puts an added premium upon superior ability and intensifies the concentration of wealth, responsibility and political power. Democracy is the most difficult of all forms of government since it requires the widest spread of intelligence and we forget to make ourselves intelligent when we made ourselves sovereign. That's a good one, isn't it? <laughs> Good day to you, Woody B. I'll read that again because that's a powerful um, sentence. Democracy is the most difficult of all forms of government since it requires the widest spread of intelligence and we forgot to make ourselves intelligent when we made ourselves sovereign. Keep reading. Keep tuning into Book Club and um, let's get um, educated. Yeah. Education has spread, but intelligence is perpetually retarded by the fertility of the simple. A cynic remarked that you mustn't enthrone ignorance just because there is so much of it. However, ignorance is not long enthroned, for it lends itself to manipulation by the forces that mould public opinion. It may be true, as Lincoln supposed, that you can't fool all the people all the time, but you can fool enough of them to rule a large country. In democracy responsible, oh sorry, is democracy responsible for the current debasement of art? The debasement, of course, is not unquestioned. It is a matter of subjective judgment, and those of us who shudder at its excesses, its meaningless blotches of colour, its collages in, of debris, its babels of cacophony, are doubtless imprisoned in our past and dulled the courage of experiment. The producers of such nonsense are appealing not to the general public, which scorns them as lunatics, degenerates or charlatans, but to gullible middle-class purchasers who are hypnotised by auctioneers and are thrilled by the new, however deformed. Democracy is responsible for this collapse only in the sense that it has not been able to develop standards and tastes to replace those with which aristocracies once kept the imagination and individualism of artists within the bounds of intelligible communication. The illumination of life and the harmony of parts in a logical sequence and, and a coherent whole. If art now seems to lose itself in bizarre 
bizarreries, this is not only because it is vulgarised by mass suggestion or domination, but also because it has exhausted the possibilities of old schools and forms and flounders for a time in the search for new patterns and styles, new rules and disciplines. All deductions having been made, democracy has done less harm and more good than any other form of government. It gave to human existence a zest and camaraderie that outweighed its pitfalls and defects. It gave to thought and science and enterprise the freedom essential to their operation and growth. It broke down the walls of privilege and class and in each generation it raised up ability from every rank and place. Under its stimulus, Athens and Rome became the most creative cities in history, and America in two centuries has provided abundance for an unprecedentedly large proportion of its population. Democracy has now dedicated itself resolutely to the spread and lengthening of education and to the maintenance of public health. If equality of educational opportunity can be established, democracy will be real and justified. For this is the vital truth beneath the catchwords, that, that though men cannot be equal, their access to education and opportunity can be made more nearly equal. The rights of man are not rights to office and power, but the rights of every entry into every avenue that may nourish and test a man's fitness for office and power. A right is not a gift of God or nature, but a privilege which it is good for the group that the individual should have. Yeah, Kathy, I agree. That's probably um, better. A better term, I'd say, or better, better still, would be wisdom, right? If you got wisdom, that would surpass all of those. In England and in the United States, in Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, in Switzerland and Canada, democracy is today sounder than ever before. It has defended itself with courage and energy against the assaults of foreign dictatorship and has not yielded to dictatorship at home. But if war continues to absorb and dominate it, or if the itch to rule the world requires a large military establishment and appropriation, the freedoms of democracy may one by one succumb to the discipline of arms and strife. If race or class war divides us into hostile camps, changing political argument into blind hate, one side or the other may overturn the hustings with the rule of the sword. If our economy of freedom fails to distribute wealth as ably as it has created it, the road to dictatorship will be open to any man who can persuasively promise security to all and a martial government under whatever charming phrases will engulf the democratic world. And so we're, we're coming to the end. We've got uh, just three chapters to go now. And uh, yeah, like I say, something different. Of course, it's not a storybook. It's a, a historical record, a concise survey of culture and civilization. And it's very interesting. There, there's a lot here, of course, that I didn't know, a lot that I've learnt and can take with me, you know, into my um, my um, work as union rep and, um, you know, fighting the good fight against the Royal Mail. <laughs> Upside down. Chapter 11, History and War. War is one of the constants of history and has not diminished with civilization or democracy. In the last 3,421 years of recorded history, only 268 have seen no war. I'll read that again because that's a powerful sentence. In the last 3,421 years of recorded history, only 268 have seen no war. We have acknowledged war as a present, sorry, we have acknowledged war as at present the ultimate form of competition and natural selection in the human species. Polemos Peter Panton, said Heraclitus, war or competition is the father of all things, the potent source of ideas, inventions, institutions and states. P. 
peace is an unstable equilibrium which can be preserved only by acknowledged supremacy or equal power. Damn. The causes of war are the same as the causes of competition among individuals. Acquisitiveness, pugnacity and pride, the desire for food, land, materials, fuels, mastery. The state has our instincts without our restraints. The individual submits to restraints laid upon him by morals and laws and agrees to replace combat with conference because the state guarantees him basic protection in his life, property and legal rights. The state itself acknowledges no substantial restraints, either because it is strong enough to defy any interference with its will, or because there is no super-state to offer it basic protection, and no international law or moral code wielding effective force. The, the individual pride gives added vigour in the competitions of life in the state. Nationalism gives added force in diplomacy and war. When the states of Europe freed themselves from papal overlordship and protection, each state encouraged nationalism as a supplement to its army and navy. If it foresaw conflict with any particular country, it fomented in its people hatred of that country and formulated catchwords to bring that hatred to a lethal point. Meanwhile, it stressed its love of peace. And so I can't not say something about that. Um, paragraph there because it's so powerful they've written this down so matter of fact so objectively that it's easy to skip over it to to miss that what they're saying you know and um, I'll just read that bit again like this this term propaganda that we often hear right and and propaganda it's used so often and with such freedom that we we often don't sort of realize the weight and how much power it can have but this is describing propaganda in one sentence if it foresaw conflict with any particular country it fomented in its people hatred of that country and formulated catchwords to bring that hatred to a lethal point meanwhile it stressed its love of peace wowzers this conscription of the soul to international phobia occurred only in the most elemental conflicts and was seldom resorted to in Europe between the religious wars of the 16th century and the wars of the French Revolution. During that interval, the peoples of conflicting states were allowed to respect one another's achievements in civilization. Englishmen travelled safely in France, while France was at war with England and the French and Frederick the Great continued to admire each other while they fought each other in the Seven Years' War. In the 17th and 18th centuries, war was a contest of aristocracies rather than of peoples. In the 20th century, the improvement of communication, transport, weapons and means of indoctrination made war a struggle of peoples involving civil civilians as well as combatants and winning victory through the wholesale destruction of property and life. One war can now destroy the labour of centuries in building cities, creating art and developing habits of civilization. In, in, in apologetic consolation, war now promotes science and technology whose deadly inventions, if they are not forgotten in universal destitution and barbarism, may later enlarge the material achievements of peace. In every century, the generals and the rulers, with rare exceptions like Ashoka and Augustus, have smiled at the philosopher's timid dislike of war. In the military interpretation of history, war is the final arbiter and is accepted as natural and necessary by all but cowards and simpletons. What, what but the victory of Charles Martel at Tours, 1732, kept France and Spain from becoming Mohammedan? What, what would have happened to our classic heritage if it had not been protected by arms against Mongol and Tatar invasions? We laugh at generals who die in bed, forgetting that they are more valuable alive than dead, but we build statues to them when they turn back, a Hitler or a Genghis Khan. It is pitiful, says the general, that so many young men die in battle, but more of them die in automobile accidents than in war, and many of them riot and rot for lack of discipline. 
They need an outlet for their combativeness, their adventurousness, their weariness with prosaic routine. If they must die sooner or later, why not let them die for their country in the anesthesia of battle and the aura of glory? Even a philosopher, if he knows history, will admit that a long peace may fatally weaken the martial muscles of a nation. In the present inadequacy of international law and sentiment, a nation must be ready at any moment to defend itself, and when its essential interests are involved, it must be allowed to use any means it considers necessary to its survival. The Ten Commandments must be silent when self-preservation is at stake. It is clear, continues the General, that, you, that the United States must assume today that the task of, that Great Britain performed so well in the 19th century, the protection of Western civilization from external danger. Communist governments armed with old birth rates and new weapons have repeatedly proclaimed their resolve to destroy the economy and independence of non-communist states. Young nations longing for an industrial revolution to give them economic wealth and military power are impressed by the rapid industrialization of Russia under governmental management. Western capitalism might be more productive in the end, but it seems slower in development. The new governors, eager to control the resources and manhood of their states, are, are a likely prey to communist propaganda, infiltration and subversion. Unless this spreading process is halted, it is only a matter of time before nearly all Asia, Africa and South America will be under communist leadership and Australia, New Zealand, North America and Western Europe will be surrounded by enemies on every side. Imagine the effect of such a condition upon Japan, the Philippines and India and upon the powerful Communist Party of Italy. Imagine the effect of a communist victory in Italy upon the communist movement in France. Great Britain, Scandinavia, the Netherlands and West Germany will be left at the mercy of an overwhelmingly communist continent. Should North America, now at the height of its power, accept such a future as inevitable, withdraw within its frontiers and let itself be encircled by hostile states, controlling its access to materials and markets and compelling it, like any besieged people, to imitate its enemies and establish governmental dictatorship over every phase of its once free and stimulating life? Should the leaders of America consider only the reluctance of this Epicurean generation to face so great an issue? Or should they consider also what future generations of Americans would wish that these leaders had done? Is it not wiser to resist at once, to carry the war to the enemy, to fight on foreign soil, to sacrifice, if it need be, a hundred thousand American lives and perhaps a million non-combatants, but to leave America free to live its own life in security and freedom? Is not such a far-sighted policy fully in accord with the lessons of history? The philosopher answers, yes and the devastating result will be in accord with history, except that they will be multiplied in proportion to the increased number of mobility of the engaged forces and the unparalleled destructiveness of the weapons used. There is something greater than history. Somewhere, sometime, in the name of humanity, we must challenge a thousand evil precedents and dare to apply the golden rule to nations, as the Buddhist king Ashoka did, or at least do what Augustus did when he bade Tiberius desist from further invasion of Germany. Let us refuse, at whatever cost to ourselves, to make a hundred Hiroshimas in China. Magnanimity in politics, said Edmund Burke, is not seldom the truest wisdom, and a great empire and little minds go ill together. Imagine an American president saying to the leaders of China and Russia, if we should follow the usual course of history, we should make war upon you for fear of what you may do a generation hence. Or we should follow the dismal president of the Holy Alliance of 1815 and dedicate our wealth and our soundest youth to suppressing any revolt against the existing order anywhere. But we are willing to try a new approach. We respect your peoples and your civilizations as among the most creative in history. We shall try to understand your feelings and your desire to develop your own institutions without fear of attack. 
We must not allow our mutual fears to lead us into war, for the unparalleled murderousness of our weapons and yours brings into the situation an element unfamiliar to history. We propose to send representatives to join with yours in a persistent conference for the adjustment of our differences, the cessation of hostilities and subversion, and the reduction of our armaments. Wherever outside our borders we may find ourselves competing with you for the allegiance of a people, we are willing to submit to a full and fair election of the population concerned. Let us open our doors to each other and organise cultural exchanges that will promote mutual appreciation and understanding. We are not afraid that your economic system will displace ours, nor need you fear that ours will displace yours. We believe that each system will learn from the other and be able to live with it in cooperation and peace. Perhaps each of us, while maintaining adequate defences, can arrange non-aggression and non-subversion pacts with the other states, and from these accords a world order may take form within, within which each nation will remain sovereign and unique, limited only by agreements freely signed. We ask you to join us in this defiance of history, this resolve to extend courtesy and civilization to the relations among states. We pledge our honour before all mankind to enter into this venture in full sincerity and trust. If we lose in the historic gamble, the result could not be worse than those that we may expect from a continuation of traditional policies. If you and we succeed, we shall merit a place for centuries to come in the grateful memory of mankind. <clears throat> the General smiles. You have forgotten all the lessons of history, he says, and all that nature of man which you described. Some conflicts are too fundamental to be resolved by negotiation, and during the prolonged negotiations, if history may be our guide, subversion would go on. A world order will come, not by a gentleman's agreement, but through so divisive, decisive a victory by one of the great powers that it will be able to dictate and enforce international law, as Rome did from Augustus to Aurelius. Such interludes of widespread peace are unnatural and exceptional. They will soon be ended by changes in the distribution of military power. You have told us that man is a competitive animal, that his states must be like himself, and that natural selection now operates on an international plane. States will unite in basic cooperation only when they are in common attacked from without. Perhaps we are now restlessly moving towards that higher plateau of competition. We may make contact with ambitious species on other planets or stars. Soon thereafter there will be interplanetary war, then and only then. Will we of this earth be one? Goodness me, that was a um, a rather a rather chilling passage, there, wasn't it? Okay, two chapters to go. Chapter 12, Growth and Decay. We have defined civilization as social order promoting cultural creation. It is political order secured through custom, morals and law, and economic order secured through a continuity of production and exchange. It is cultural creation through freedom and facilities for the origination, expression, testing and fruition of ideas, letters, manners and arts. It is an intricate and precarious web of human relationships laboriously built and readily destroyed. Why is it that history is littered with the ruins of civilizations and seems to tell us like Shelley's Ozymandias, that death is the destiny of all. Are there any regularities in this process of growth and decay which may enable us to predict from the course of past civilizations the future of our own? Certain imaginative spirits have thought so even to predicting the future in detail. In his fourth Eclogy, Virgil announced 
that some day the ingenuity of chance having been exhausted, the whole universe, by design or accident, will fall into a condition precisely the same as in some forgotten antiquity, and will then repeat, by deterministic fatality, and in every particular, all those events that had followed that condition before. Oh no, I'm not going to read that. We have some Latin there that I'm just going to breeze over and read the translation, I think. There will then be another prophet, Typhus, and another Argo will carry Jason and other beloved heroes. There will also be other wars, and great Achilles will again be sent to Troy. Friedrich Nietzsche went insane with this vision of eternal recurrence. There is nothing so foolish, but it can be found in the philosophers. History repeats itself, but only in outline and in the large. We may reasonably expect that in the future, as in the past, some new states will rise, some old states will subside, that new civilizations will begin with pasture and agriculture, expand into commerce and industry, and luxuriate with finance. That thought, as Vico and Comte argued, will pass by and large from supernatural to legendary to naturalistic explanations, that new theories, inventions, discoveries and errors will agitate the intellectual currents, that new generations will rebel against the old and pass from rebellion to conformity and reaction, that experiments in morals will loosen tradition and frighten its beneficiaries, and that the excitement of innovation will be forgotten in the unconcern of time. History repeats itself in the large, because human nature changes with geological leisureliness, and man is equipped to respond in stereotyped ways to frequently occurring situations and stimuli like hunger, danger and sex. But in a developed and complex civilization, individuals, individuals are more differentiated and unique than in primitive society, and many situations contain novel circumstances requiring modifications of instinctive response. Custom recedes, reasoning spreads and results are less predictable. There is no certainty that the future will repeat the past. Every year is an adventure. Some masterminds have sought to constrain the loose regularities of history into majestic paradigms. The founder of French socialism, Claude Henri de Rouvroy, Comte de Saint-Simon, divided the past and the future into an alteration of organic and critical periods. Saint-Simon believed that the establishment of socialism would begin a new organic age of undefied belief, organisation, cooperation and stability. If communism should prove to be the triumphant new order of life, St. Simon's analysis and prediction would be justified. Oswald Spengler varied St. Simon's scheme by dividing history into separate civilizations, each with an independent lifespan and trajectory composed of four seasons, but essentially two periods one of centripetal organisation unifying a culture in its phases into a unique, coherent and artistic form, the other a period of centrifugal disorganisation in which creed and culture decompose in division and criticism and end in chaos of individualism, scepticism and artistic aberrations. <clears throat> Where a Saint Simon looked forward to socialism as the new synthesis, Spengler, like Talleyrand, looked backward to aristocracy as, as the age in which life and thought were consistent and orderly and constituted a work of living art. On one point, all are agreed civilizations begin, flourish, decline, and disappear or linger on as stagnant pools left by once life-giving streams? What are the causes of development, and what are the causes of decay? No student takes seriously the 17th century notion that states arose out of a social contract among individuals or between the people and a ruler. Probably most states, i.e. societies politically organised, took form through the conquest of one group by another and the establishment of a continuing force over the conquered sorry 
and the establishment of a continuing force over the conquered by the conqueror. His decrees were their first laws, and these added to the customs of the people, created a new social order. Some states of Latin America obviously began in this way. When the masters organized the work of their subjects to take advantage of some physical boon, like the rivers of Egypt or Asia, economic prevision and provision constituted another basis for civilization. A dangerous tension between rulers and ruled might raise intellectual and emotional activity above the daily drift of primitive tribes. Further stimulation to growth could come from any challenging change in the surroundings, such as external invasion or a continuing shortage of rain, challenges that may be met by military improvements or the construction of irrigation canals. If we put the problem further back and ask what determines whether a challenge will or will not be met, the answer is that this depends upon the presence or absence of initiative and of creative individuals with clarity of mind and energy of will, which is almost a definition of genius, capable of effective responses to new situations, which is almost a definition of intelligence. If we ask what makes a creative individuals, uh, sorry, if we ask what makes a creative individual, we are thrown back from histories to psychology and biology, to the influence of environment and the gamble and secret, and secret of the chromosomes. In any case, a challenge successfully met, as by the United States in 1917, 1933 and 1941, if it does not exist, the victor, like England in 1945, raises the temper and level of a nation and makes it abler to meet further challenges. Yeah, this, this, um, sorry, this chapter, Growth and Decay, is fascinating because I'm very taken by a book by um, Ray Dalio, The Changing World Order, um, Why Nations Rise and Fall brilliant book. I've read it several times because it's so moving and, and interesting. And there's also a book, I can't remember who's the author or authors, I think maybe, The Fourth Turning. And b before I read Dalio, I didn't, I didn't really consider that Nate, civilizations rise and fall. Of course, you've got Gibbon's The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. And of course, Greece, the Greek Empire isn't here anymore and neither are the Mongols. But in our present time and life, you don't consider that, you know? I mean, America could cease to be. That's very unlikely, but it, it appears from everything that's going on in geopolitics that it doesn't have the, the same weight and power that it once had, you know, after 1945. And, um, yeah, when there's a vacuum especially a power vacuum, it's often filled pretty quickly. <clears throat> if these are the sources of growth, what are the causes of decay? S shall we suppose with Spengler and many others that each civilization is an organism, naturally and yet mysteriously endowed with the power of development and the fatality of death? It is tempting to explain the behaviour of groups through analogy with physiology or physics and to ascribe the deterioration of a society to some inherent limit in its loan and tenure of life or some irreparable running down of internal force. Such analogies may offer provisional illumination as when we compare the association of individuals with an aggregation of cells or the circulation of money from banker back to banker with the systole and diastole of the heart. But a group is no organism physically added to its constituent individuals. It has no brain or stomach of its own. It must think or feel with the brains or nerves of its members. When groups or civilizations decline, it is through no mystic limitation of a corporate life, but through the failure of its political or intellectual leaders to meet the challenges of change. The challenges may come from a dozen sources and may be, and may be rep, oh sorry, the challenges may come from a dozen sources and may by repetition or combination rise to a destructive intensity. Rainfall or oasis may fail and leave the earth parched to sterility. 
the soil may be exhausted by incompetent husbandry or improvident usage. The replacement of free with slave labour may reduce the incentives to production, leaving lands untilled and cities unfed. A change in instruments or routes of trades as by the conquest of the ocean or the air may leave old centres of civilization becalmed and decadent like Pisa or Venice after 1492. Taxes may mount to the point of discouraging capital investment and productive stimulus. Foreign markets and materials may be lost to more enterprising competition. Excess of imports over exports may drain precious metal from domestic reserves. The concentration of wealth may disrupt the nation in class or race war. The concentration of population and poverty in great cities may compel a government to choose between enfeebling the economy with a dole and running the risk of riot and revolution. <clears throat> Since inequality grows in an expanding economy, a society may find itself divided between a cultured minority and a majority of men and women too unfortunate by nature or circumstance to inherit or develop standards of excellence and taste. As this majority grows, it acts as a cultural drag upon the minority. Its ways of speech, dress, recreation, feeling, judgment and thought spread upward and internal barbarization by the majority is part of the price that the minority pays for its control of education and economic opportunity. As education spreads, theologies lose credence and receive an external conformity without influence upon conduct or hope. Life and ideas become increasingly secular, ignoring supernatural explanations and fears. The moral code loses aura and force as its human origin is revealed and as divine surveillance and sanctions are removed. In ancient Greece, the philosophers destroyed the old faith among the educated classes. In many nations of modern Europe, the philosophers achieved similar results. Protagoras became Voltaire, Diogenes Rousseau, Democritus Hobbes, Plato Kant, Thrasymachus Nietzsche, Aristotle Spencer, Epicurus Dedroit. In antiquity and modernity alike, analytical thought dissolved the religion that had buttressed the moral code. New religions came, but they were divorced from the ruling classes and gave no service to the state. An age of weary scepticism and epicureanism followed the triumph of rationalism over mythology in the last century before Christianity and follows a similar victory today in the first century after Christianity. And that's a very interesting little bit there where he, um, you know, the historical and the modern Philosopher, very interesting. Caught in the relaxing interval between one moral code and the next, an unmoored generation surrenders itself to luxury, corruption and a restless disorder of family and morals in all but a remnant clinging desperately to old restraints and ways. Few souls feel any longer that it is beautiful and honourable to die for one's country. A failure of leadership may allow a state to weaken itself with internal strife. At the end of the process, a decisive defeat in war may bring a final blow, or barbarian invasion from without may combine with barbarism welling up from within to bring the civilization to a close. Is this a depressing picture? Not quite. Life is an inherent claim to eternity, whether in individuals or in states. Death is natural, and if it comes in, in due time, it is forgivable and useful, and the mature mind will take no offence from its coming. But do civilizations die? Again, not quite. Greek civilization is not really dead, only its frame is gone and its habitat has changed and spread. It survives in the memory of the race, and in such abundance that no one life, however full and long, could absorb it all. Homer has more readers now than in his own day and land. The Greek poets and philosophers are in every library and college. At this moment, Plato is being studied by a hundred thousand discoverers of the dear light of philosophy over spreading life with understanding thought. See The Republic on Book Club and the uh, Platonic Dialogues over on Lewis Kirk if you want to join those hundred of thousands discoverers of the dear light of philosophy.
This selective survival of creative minds is the most real and beneficent of immortalities. Nations die, old regions grow arid or suffer other change. Resilient man picks up his tools and his arts and moves on, taking his memories with him. If education has deepened and broadened those memories, civilization migrates with him and builds somewhere another home. In the new land he need not begin entirely anew, nor make his way without friendly aid. Communication and transport bind him, as in a nourishing placenta with his motherly country. Rome imported Greek civilization and transmitted it to Western Europe. America profited from European civilization and prepares to pass it on with a technique of transmission never equaled before. Civilizations are the generations of the, ra of the racial soul. As life overrides death with reproduction, and so an ageing culture hands its patrimony down to its heirs across the years and the seas. Even these lines are being written, commerce and print, wise and waves and invisible mercuries of the air are binding nations and civilizations together, preserving for all what each has given to the heritage of mankind. And we've arrived at the, the final chapter And I've really enjoyed this reading. Maybe not as engaging and fun as a storybook, but yeah, it's almost like it's um, it does it a bit of an injustice, I feel, reading it like it's a story. You know, we read an hour earlier today and now we're reading, yeah, it's going to be two and a half hours to finish all the chapters. Um, but I think it, yeah, like I say, I, I don't think it... Uh, it does it justice. I think one chapter should be read and then sort of sat and pondered on. But anyway, we haven't got time for that. Not unless you guys want it. Um, because, yeah, that would be a different thing, wouldn't it? A, uh, a sort of commentary on... And I don't think I'm qualified to do it, so... I don't think that will be happening. But anyway, the final chapter, chapter 13... Is progress real? Against this panorama of nations, morals and religions rising and falling, the idea of progress finds itself in dubious shape. Is it only the vain and traditional boast of each modern generation? Since we have admitted no substantial change in man's nature during historic times, all technological advances will have to be written off as merely new means of achieving old ends. The acquisition of goods, the pursuit of one sex by the other, or by the same, the overcoming of competition, the fighting of wars. One of the discouraging discoveries of our disillusioning century is that science is neutral. It will kill for us as readily as it will heal, and, it, and will destroy for us more readily than it can build. How inadequate now seems the proud motto of Francis Bacon, knowledge is power. I like that one. Sometimes we feel that the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, which stressed mythology and art rather than science and power, may have been wiser than we, who repeatedly enlarge our instrumentalities without improving our purposes. Our progress in science and technique has involved some tincture of evil with good. Our comforts and conveniences may have weakened our physical stamina and our moral fibre. We have immensely developed our means of locomotion. But some of us use them to facilitate crime and to kill our fellow men or ourselves. We double, triple, centuple our speed, but we shatter our nerves in the process and are the same trousered apes as 2,000 miles at 2,000 miles an hour as when we had legs. That's brilliant. We applaud the cures and incisions of modern medicine if they bring no side effects worse than the malady. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> we appreciate the assiduity of our physicians in their mad race with the resilience of microbes and the inventiveness of disease. We are grateful for the added years that medical science gives us if they are not a burden, some prolongation of illness. Oh, sorry, are not a burdensome prolongation of illness, disability and gloom. 
We have multiplied a hundred times our ability to learn and report the events of the day and the planet, but at times we envy our ancestors whose peace was only gently disturbed by the news of their village. We have laudably bettered the conditions of life for skilled working men in the middle class, but we have allowed our cities to fester with dark ghettos and slimy slums. We frolic in our emancipation from theology, but we have developed a natural ethic, a moral code independent of religion, strong enough to keep our instincts of acquisition, pugnacity and sex from debasing our civilization into a mire of greed, crime and promiscuity. Have we really outgrown intolerance or merely transferred it from religious to national, ideological or racial hostilities? Are our manners better than before or worse? Manners, said a 19th century traveller, get regularly worse as you go from east to west. It is bad in Asia, not so good in Europe and altogether bad in the western states of America. And now the east imitates the west. Have our laws offered the criminal too much protection against society and the state? Have we given ourselves more freedom than our intelligence can digest? Or are we nearing such moral and social disorder that frightened parents will run back to Mother Church and beg her to discipline their children, at whatever cost to intellectual liberty? Has all the progress of philosophy since Descartes been a mistake through its failure to recognise the role of myth in the consolation and control of man? He that increaseth knowledge increaseth sorrow, sorrow, and in much wisdom is much grief. Has there been any progress at all in philosophy since Confucius, or in literature since Aeschylus? Are we sure that our music, with its complex forms and powerful orchestras, is more profound than Palestrina, or more musical and inspiring than the melodic airs that medieval Arabs sang to the strumming of their simple instruments? Edward Lane said of the Cairo musicians, I have been more charmed with their songs than with any other music that I have ever enjoyed. How does our contemporary architecture, bold, original and impressive as it is, compare with the temples of ancient Egypt or Greece, our sculpture with the statues of Kef Kefren and Hermes, our bas-reliefs with the, those of Persepolis or the Parthenon, our paintings with those of the Van Eyck or Holbein? If the replacement of chaos with order is the essence of art and civilization, is contemporary painting in America and Western Europe the replacement of order in chaos and a vivid symbol of our civilization's relapse into confused and structureless decay? History is so indifferently rich that a case for almost any conclusion from it can be made by a selection of instances Choosing our evidence with a brighter bias, we might evolve some more comforting reflections. But perhaps we should first define what progress means to us. It means, if it means increase in happiness, its case is lost almost at first sight. That's very sad, isn't it? If it means increase in happiness, its case is lost almost at first sight. Our capacity for fretting is endless, and no matter how many difficulties we surmount, how many ideals we realise, we shall always find an excuse for being magnificently miserable. There is a stealthy pleasure in rejecting mankind or the universe as unworthy of our approval. It seems silly to define progress in terms that would make the average child a higher, more advanced product of life than the adult of or the sage. <laughs> for certainly the child is the happiest of the three. Is a more objective definition possible? We shall here define progress as the increasing control of the environment by life. It is a test that may hold for the lowliest organism as well as for man. We must not demand of progress that it should be continuous or universal. Obviously there are retrogressions just as there are periods of failure, fatigue and rest in a developing individual. If the present stage is an advance in control of the environment, progress is real. We may presume that at almost any time in history, some nations were progressing and some were declining, as Russia progresses and England loses ground today. 
The same nation may be progressing in one field of human activity and retrogressing in another, as America is now progressing in technology and receding in the graphic arts. If we find that the type of genius prevalent in young countries like America and Australia tends to the practical, inventive, scientific, executive kinds rather than to the painter of pictures or poems, the carver of statues or words, we must understand that each age and place needs and elicits some types of ability rather than others in its pursuit of environmental control. We should not compare the work of one land and time with the winnowed best of all the collective past. Our problem is whether the average man has increased his ability to control the conditions of his life. If we take a long-range view and compare our modern existence, precarious, chaotic and murderous as it is, with the ignorance, superstition, violence and diseases of primitive peoples, we do not quite come off quite forlorn. The lowliest strata in civilized states may still differ only slightly from barbarians, but above those levels thousands, millions have reached mental and moral levels rarely found among primitive men. Under the complex strains of city life we sometimes take imaginative refuge in the supposed simplicity of pre-civilized ways, but in our less romantic moments we know that this is a flight reaction from our actual tasks and that the idolizing of savages like many other young moods is an impatient expression of adolescent maladaptation, of conscious ability not yet matured and comfortably placed. The friendly and flowing savage would be delightful but for his scalpel, his insects and his dirt. A study of surviving primitive tribes reveals their high rate of infantile mortality, their short tenure of life, their lesser stamina and speed, their greater susceptibility to disease. If the prolongation of life indicates better control of the environment, then the tables of mortality proclaim the advance of man, for longevity in European and American whites has tripled in the last three centuries. Some time ago a convention of morticians discussed the danger threatening their industry from the increasing tardiness of man in keeping their rendezvous with death. But if undertakers are miserable, progress is real. In the debate between ancients and moderns it is not so clear at all that the ancients carry off the prize. Shall we count it a trivial achievement that famine has been eliminated in modern states and that one country can now grow enough food to overfeed itself and yet send hundreds of millions of bushels of wheat to nations in need? Are we ready to scuttle the science that has so diminished superstition obscurantism and religious intolerance or the technology that has spread food, home ownership, comfort, education and leisure beyond any precedent? Would we really prefer the Athenian Agora or the Roman Comita to the British Parliament or the United States Congress, or be content under a narrow franchise like Atticus, or the selection of rulers by a, pa a Praetorian Guard? Would we rather have lived under the laws of the Athenian Republic or the Roman Empire than under constitutions that give us hab habeas corpus, trial by jury, religious and intellectual freedom and the emancipation of women? Are our morals, lax though they are, worse than those of the ambisexual Alcibiades? Or has any American president imitated Pericles who lived with a learned courtesan? Are we ashamed of our great universities, our many publishing houses, our bountiful public libraries? There were great dramatists in Athens, but was any greater than Shakespeare? And was Aristophanes as profound and humane as Moliere? Was the oratory of Demosthenes, Isocrates and Aeschines superior to that of Chatham, Burke and Sheridan? Shall we place Gibbon below Herodotus or Thucydides? Is there anything in ancient prose fiction comparable to the scope and depth of the modern novel? We may grant the superiority of the ancients in art, though some of us might still prefer Notre Dame de Paris to the Parthenon. If the founding fathers of the United States could return to America, or Fox and Bentham to England, or Voltaire and Detroit to France, would they not reproach us as ingrates for our blindness to our good food? Sorry, to our good fortune in living today and not yesterday, not even under Pericles or Augustus.
we should not be greatly disturbed by the probability that our civilization will die like any other. As Frederick asked his retreating troops in Colin, would you live for ever? Perhaps it is desirable that life should take fresh forms, that new civilizations and centres should have their turn. Meanwhile, the effort to meet the challenge of the rising East may invigorate the West. We have said that a great civilization may not entirely die, non omnis moritur. Some precious achievements have survived all the vicissitudes of rising and falling states, the making of fire and light, of the wheel and other basic tools, language, writing, art and song, agriculture, the family and parental care, social organization, morality, the charity and the use of teaching to transmit the law of the family and the race. These are the elements of civilization, and they have been tenaciously maintained through the perilous passage of one civilization to the next. They are the connective tissue of human history. If education is the transmission of civilization, we are unquestionably progressing. Civilization is not inherited, it has to be learned and earned by each generation anew. If the transmission should be interrupted for one century, civilization would die and we should be savages again. So our finest contemporary achievement is our unprecedented expenditure of wealth and toil in the provision of higher education for all. Hello there. Once colleges were luxuries designed for the male half of the leisure class, today universities are so numerous that he who runs may become that he who runs may become a PhD. We may not have excelled the selected geniuses of antiquity, but we have raised the level of avri and average of knowledge beyond any age in history. None but a child will complain that our teachers have not yet eradicated the errors and superstitions of 10,000 years. The great experiment has just begun and it may yet be defeated by the high birth rate of unwilling or indoctrinated ignorance. But what would be the full fruitage of instruction if every child should be schooled till at least his twentieth year, and should find free access to the universities, libraries and museums that harbour and offer the intellectual and artistic treasures of the race? Consider education not as the painful accumulation of facts and dates and reigns, nor merely the necessary preparation of the individual to earn his keep in the world, but as the transmission of our mental, moral, technical and aesthetic heritage as fully as possible to as many as possible for the enlargement of man's understanding, control, embellishment and enjoyment of life. The heritage that we can now fully transmit is richer than ever before. It is richer than that of Pericles, for it includes all of the Greek flowering that followed him. Richer than Leonardo's, for it includes him and the Italian Renaissance. Richer than Voltaire's, for it embraces all the French Enlightenment and its ecumenical dissemination. If progress is real despite our whining, it is not because we are born any healthier, better or wiser than infants were in the past, but because we are born to a richer heritage, born on a higher level of that pedestal which the accumulation of knowledge and art raises as the ground and support of our being. The heritage rises and man rises in proportion as he receives it. History is, above all else, the creation and recording of that heritage. Progress is its increasing abundance, preservation, transmission and use to those of us who study history not merely as a warning reminder of man's follies and crimes, but also as an encouraging remembrance of generative souls. The past ceases to be a depressing chamber of horrors. It becomes a celestial city, a spacious country of the mind, wherein a thousand saints, statesmen, inventors, scientists, poets, artists, musicians, lovers and philosophers still live and speak, teach and carve and sing. The historian will not mourn because he can see no meaning in human existence except that which man puts into it. Let it be our pride that we ourselves may put meaning into our lives and sometimes a significance that transcends death. If a man is fortunate, he will, before he dies, gather up as much as he can of his civilized heritage and transmit it to his children, and to his final breath he will be grateful for his inexhaustible legacy, knowing that it is our nourishing mother and our lasting life.
the end. And I'll tell you what, what, a, um, what an education. What an education that was in uh, two and a bit hours. Real education. I mean, I know a bit of history, not much, like I said. Um, but yeah, I mean, a real education. And also, one thing that I've sort of gathered and took from it, that the Durants love history <laughs> you know it is an amazing book and i'm not going to because it will be very expensive likely but it would be so interesting wouldn't it maybe later on the channel if everyone wants to um read it we can get their um 10 volume work and work through that the story of civilization but i imagine that would be a little bit dry and people would get bored quickly so it's unlikely that we'll be doing the history of civilization, but what we will do is be reading other books. Like I say, I'm away for the weekend, so it'll be quiet on the channel. I'm going to prepare some more Gurdjieff commentaries. I'm going to prepare some shorts and some uh, community posts. Everyone seems to like the um, the library images and images of books and studies and, you know, reading memes. So I'll continue with all of those. Uh, like I say, Gurdjieff uh, commentaries coming. And then on Friday, I'll post the poll that will begin on Monday. And it will contain some very interesting books. Um, the Two Towers, Lord of the Rings, Pride and Prejudice, The Bone Collector, Ready Player Two, and the next in the Famous Five series. So keep your eyes out for that. Be sure to vote. Tell a friend to vote as well and to come and join us at the next live reading. And again, thanks everyone for joining me. KBNJ, very deep indeed. A lot to ponder, my friend, a lot to think about. Because a bit of what I've took away there is that we think that history is, you know, writings in the past. But what it really is, is you and I making the future that we want it is sort of a a funny thing for the brain isn't it in a sense we're creating history now book club who knows in 10 years what book club could become you know we don't know but what we can do is i can come and i can read and do my best and try and be engaged and friendly and just be myself i suppose because that's what people want authenticity but we have to make today as we would like to see tomorrow and we have to create the world that we would want our children to live in. And again, that's my two pennies worth from my soapbox, my, uh, my view of history and I will end with a quote from Gandhi. He said, be the change you want to see in the world. Take care, guys. I'll see you soon. Have a happy Easter and I'll see you on the other side. Bye guys. See you.